Hi, I'm Taylor. And I'm Megan. And this is The, the Bee Club. Club. Today, we visited another local honeybee farm. We got the opportunity to go see the Basking Bee Apiary in Lovettsville, Virginia with Mr. Seuss. He knows a lot about bees and we learned so much on this trip. In addition to seeing all of his hives and the honey extraction process, we also got to see how his beekeeping differs from Mr. Olette's. We're both very thankful for the experience that we both got to share and we're very thankful that we got the opportunity to work with Mr. Seuss and we learned a lot about the environment along the way. to uh, start the smoker. So this is basically just a canister. And that canister has a hole at the bottom and then it has a bellows on it which just blows air through. And what this does is it, we put a fuel in here. I use uh, pine needles and pine cones. And that fuel then is creating a smoke. And we use this smoke to help uh, manage and manipulate the bees a little bit when necessary. For me, a smoker is there as, an, uh, as a backup this time of year. You generally don't need a smoker right now because there's so much pollen and so much nectar out there. If you get into them, they aren't as worried about their resources, their pollen and nectar resources, because there's so much out there, they can always go get more. So this is your pine needle. I pick them up from my yard. Pine trees around here. Mm -hmm. Very uh, easy resource to get. And it's free. <laughs> it's free, yep. And then we'll turn, do it this way because the wind's blowing that way. Light it. As you can tell, it does produce quite a bit. We'll have the hive open, and there'll be bees over here, and I'll just take them. Puff a little bit of smoke on them, and that causes them to go down into the hive itself. The working theory is that when they smell smoke, they are immediately enticed to go get as much resource as they can in case there is a fire. Mm -hmm. If that fire comes and destroys the hive, they can go off those resources and possibly either help another hive to go in and join that, or if their queen survives, to create another hive somewhere else. Smoke also acts as a pheromone cover. So bees communicate in multiple different ways. They communicate visually, they'll communicate with their bodies by actually touching and bumping and buzzing and, and shaking their wings. And they communicate with pheromones. And this will cover the pheromone sense that they're emitting, um, especially when they're emitting an alarm pheromone. So let's go ahead and open up a colony. So this is the hive we're going to open. So I strap them down, just in case we get heavy winds. Mm -hmm. the hive box. I have a picture on it because the bees actually help identify what is their hive with the various different items that you might put in them. Oh, wow. How tall it is, what color you paint, anything that you indicate it with. So, so this is the outer cover. It gives overall weather protection mm -hmm. so that rain, snow, sleet, whatever the case might be, doesn't get in there. This is the vent box. It allows air to come up through the inner cover here. That air kind of vents through. It allows the bees to move the air through the hive. They're doing that to help reduce the humidity of the nectar that they brought in so that they can reduce that humidity and start turning it into honey. Honey is about a 17 to 18 percent water. The rest of it is sugar and the other stuff that comes in with nectar. When it comes in, it could be up to 40 percent liquid or more. They fan the honey with their wings. That reduces the water in it, creates humidity, and they use their wings and create a channel effect to get that humidity out of the hive so that it doesn't get back into the honey. They'll use their wings to move air around for various different reasons. They may want to spread the pheromones of the hive around a little bit more. So they'll actually be turned around and be facing to the inside of the hive with their hinds up and out and they're flapping their wings and spreading the hive's pheromone scent out. I have some uh, screening that I use for venting. Those are some bees collecting on the top of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this inner cover is here to help with vent control. They also make a product called propolis that's very, very sticky, which you'll see here in a second. This will help us keep the outer cover and other pieces from just being glued down versus larger pieces in dealing with that propolis. Like I said, this time of year they tend to be very, very calm. Just because it's spring, there's a lot out there, they can know they have resources available to them. So with the pollen, they have a proboscis, all right? Typically I think of proboscis is referring to the nose, but it's actually their tongue. They have the mandibles and then a tongue that kind of rolls back into their head. Um, that tongue is, they can extrude that. 
and they'll reach it in and they'll suck the nectar out of the plants. The pollen, they have their back legs come off their thorax area, come out and they become very, very wide and flat, and then go down to a foot, an ankle, kind of in a foot. They are what is referred to as a pollen basket. And what they do is they get into a flower. They'll also kind of get in amongst all the pollen and that will get on their fur. They will then take their four legs and wipe it down off of them, collecting it into large amounts. And then they use a little bit of nectar, get it all moist and pack it onto that flat spot on their leg. And that's how they keep it on their leg so they can fly back to the hive and deposit it. So this tool is what I use the most. It's the hive tool. Helps us manipulate the boxes, helps us manipulate the frames. What we have here is a frame that they put a lot of nectar in. There's a lot of the liquid in there. They don't have quite enough of the uh, humidity out of it yet. Mm -hmm. And so they haven't capped it yet. So this stuff is honey underneath all these wax cappings. Mm -hmm. They use wax to cover over each of the cells and it will uh, keep that honey from uh, gathering more water throughout the year. Honey is hydrophilic, meaning it attracts water or wa oh. it likes to soak in water. So that wax capping keeps the water from getting back into the honey oh, and increasing cool. the humidity of it. There's another one very similar, but they've got a lot more wax on it. Yeah. So it's a lot more prepared. That one looks heavy. Yeah. <laughs> it is heavy. Do you want to hold it? Uh, sure. <laughs> there we go. Oh, it is pretty heavy, it's, actually. They are heavy, yeah. That's about uh, two pounds of honey. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is one I put on last week, mm -hmm. and now they're taking, it had the comb already built out. They have the comb, the wax comb built onto them already. Mm -hmm. Bees have drawn this out over a number of years, wow. or, or, or at some point over the last few years, rather. This is what I use to collect the honey with. So mm -hmm. they'll put the honey in these as I build it out, and then they'll just fill them up as we go through. Yeah, like cool. cool. <laughs> so this one's empty at the moment. This one's very light. Let's compare it to what the other one is. It's so pretty heavy. <laughs> But compared to that one, it's Glad not. you didn't let me hold that one. <laughs> right here is just a full frame of wow. honey. The pattern in the wax yeah. is so cool. We actually refer to this as wet wax mm -hmm. or a wet look because it's touching the honey right underneath it in a lot of areas. But then when you don't see so much of the, the dark, then it's a dry wax or um, an air bubble underneath. So now we should be getting into some brood areas. And the brood is primarily going to be in this vein right here, in this stretch of uh, frames. Uh, so this time of year, you'll find bees in all the levels. Where they are depends upon what they're using that particular box for. So these are brood box, brood box, honey super, because there's very little brood in it. But you can sit at a brood box because there is some. Honey super, honey super. They're all the same type of box. They're all the same type of frames. It just depends upon what they're doing in it at the time. And that's how they naturally do this. They put all the honey above them and then they build lower and lower until they run out of room. And there are different methodologies to try and get them to think that you know they haven't run out of space, <laughs> that they can just stay where they are in the brood area and just keep filling in the honey at the top. The bees can detect, because bees see from about the low end of red through ultraviolet in the uh, visual spectrum. They go from about orange red to ultraviolet. And the plants put out this ultraviolet signal when they have nectar essentially like an airport runway all the lights say hey here's nectar come feed on us because it's beneficial for the plants because that's how they reproduce so right now i have almost 30 just about wow. 30 but they're in different states i actually sell bees as well so i sell oh. what we call nucleus packages and with that i uh, break the hive apart so that they can split and then create new queens it's sometimes difficult to see but what we have here is a bunch of eggs that have now turned into larvae. So you see those white inside the cell? They're sort of like C's. They're all curled up. See all that white in there? Yeah. Those are all larvae. And in another day or two, with these, you see how big they are. They'll actually put a wax capping over them, and that's where they will finish developing. And then when they're done, <clears throat> they will eat their way out of that wax capping, turn around, clean up that cell, make it ready for the next use. They'll find out where the food is being stored, mm -hmm. and they'll start feeding other eggs and other larvae the food that they need to grow. Okay, let me show you a drone here. There's one right here. So that's a drone right there. Okay. That's a male bee. Male bees do not have stingers, but they are loud and they do get grumpy. <laughs> and they make a lot of noise when they're disturbed. The drones, are, of course, are going to mate with virgin queens and the queen can start laying uh, viable eggs. But all their eggs are going to be drones unless they're fertilized. Mm -hmm. And then a fertilized egg becomes a female egg mm -hmm. and then it will most likely be a worker. But on occasion, of course, they need to produce queens. And so the way they feed that egg depends upon whether it becomes a worker or a queen. Environmental impacts 
are kind of widespread with these. But one of the, the major issues that they have is product that we put on our horticulture, typically lawns. So herbicides can be problematic. They're not usually as bad as things like fungicides and pesticides. So it's the buildup of the fungicides, pesticides, and herbicides in the area, or if someone should spray at an inopportune time when the bees are out collecting, that causes them to get exposed to it directly. And then they can either die from it directly or it will be brought back into the hive. Northern Springs actually collects a lot of the environmental stuff that's out there. So what happens is they'll get a little bit on them, they'll bring it back to the hive, and it gets built up in the wax because they're constantly walking on the wax, constantly trading food resources back and forth. They don't want to have that buildup of the environmental factors such as herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides. So one of the things that we can do to help bees as we go along is to reduce the amounts that we use. But if we accept the fact that we have dandelions or use other mechanisms to remove these weeds, better uh, mowing practices, then those weeds can maybe still exist somewhat, but we're not using the chemicals that are harmful to the bees. Now, I put this box on last week. There were no comb built on it. It was just the foundation, which is what we call this with no wax on it, mm -hmm. it's just called foundation. Different types of foundation you can have. It's This is plastic foundation. You can have a, a wax foundation where they actually put it through a roller and it makes this print. Wow. Um, <laughs> I like using plastic because it's more durable. And over the week, they have done this. Wow. So they built out all that wax. Mm -hmm. Clean and, and nice looking that wax is. <laughs> so next week I'll have to put another box on here or make these instead of having a five frame mm -hmm. box, I'll put them in the ten frame boxes like the bigger ones. Ooh, this one looks to be mostly honey, but with these, the way they're situated, typically you're gonna have a lot of your brood in the middle. Mm -hmm. It looks like they filled up the brood area with honey. See, so yeah, they put a lot of nectar in there. A week ago this would have had a lot of brood in it, mm -hmm. and then they all that brood hatched, and now they're putting in nectar. All right, this is very young brood. Everything in here is one to five day old eggs. Wow. Well, they look like tiny, tiny little grains of rice. They usually stand upright from the bottom. They feed all the bee bread and nectar and uh, pollen concoctions that they make. <clears throat> one of the concoctions they make is royal jelly. These cells that you see right here at the mm -hmm. bottom, mm -hmm. these are queen cups. These are pre-stages to making new queens. Now they always typically will make a queen cup. It doesn't mean they're going to swarm, mm -hmm. but they're prepared to do it if they want to. They feed it pretty much an exclusive diet of royal jelly. That's why it's called royal jelly. Mm -hmm. It refers to the queen's food, but they feed other bees bee bread. They do mm -hmm. not feed bee bread to the queen. We believe that when you feed bees bee bread that has straight nectar and pollen in it, it actually stunts their reproductive development. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you feed just royal jelly, then it will create a queen because it allows the queen to fully develop with all her full reproductive capabilities. Oh. So that the only difference between a worker bee and a queen bee is what they were fed as they were gestated. Was, yeah, okay, so these are all the remnants of queen cells. Oh. Okay, they haven't cleaned them all up yet. And then it looks like they had three, maybe four, and um, one of them should be the new queen of this hive at this point. What are um, some of the types of plants that are the best for bee pollination? A lot of your wildflowers, then a lot of your cone flowers, so your echinaceas, your black-eyed susans, all the ones that produce a nice radiant corolla of the, the leaf petal, and then have that nice brown cone that then produces the seed out of that. Those are beautiful, beautiful flowers for your bees. But they do like a whole variety of things. They are generalist bees, but they are not tied to one or two or three different types of plants. They will go out and take anything they can. It's mm -hmm. funny we talk about this. We actually made a garden mm -hmm. full of like pollinator friendly Mm -hmm. and yeah. <laughs> we talked a little bit earlier about how they lift their rear ends and fan. Mm -hmm. They're spreading the pheromone out. <laughs> they create a slightly different bee that has more fat body in the wintertime because that bee isn't going out. It is going to overwinter. And instead of just going out and maybe living for 25 days, going through its life cycle in the summertime, in the wintertime, those bees need to live up to six months. And that's where you really start getting into trouble if you have unhealthy bees mm -hmm. because if they don't live that six month period or thereabouts then your colony is going to die off before they have an opportunity to get into spring and start bringing that that bee cycle back in again to start doing that collection that's where your environmental impacts come in so the negative effects are really visible 
as you go through the winter time, especially late winter, early spring. More beekeepers lose bees in late February, early March mm -hmm. than at any other time of the year. Those bees weren't quite healthy enough to last long enough to make it into the next cycle. This is a swarm I captured. They're filling in a lot of the brood area with nectar and pollen. You see there's a lot of drones, which is a little unusual. All these big guys with big eyes, as compared to the bees. All of this capped brood, all the open cat, uh, open cells, they had all the eggs in there and all the, the seas, the little sea larvae, sea shit. Now they have been capped over here. And underneath all of these caps is a larva that's pupating, turning into a pupa, and then it will turn into a bee. I marked seven of them. Oh, there she is, right oh. there. Oh, is it with the white With arm? the white dot. So you can see, now the white dot definitely makes it easy to find, right? Yeah. Um, you can find her without that because she has a very different body shape, mm -hmm. but it, yeah, she's much longer. Underneath that white dot, she actually doesn't have much in the way of hair. She actually has a, a big black carapace, as opposed to all the rest of the bees you see, which are pretty fuzzy. So this is just a black dot. There's no hair there generally, or very, very fine, uh, hard to see hair. And these bees that are around her, they are queen attendants. So they'll feed her and make sure she has all her resources so she can just keep walking around and laying eggs. So that's a queen. I'm glad you got to see nice. her. Yeah. <laughs> Your regular average green, flush, you know, lush, flat log mm -hmm. doesn't do anything to these. No. And, or much in the way for any pollinator. With planting more garden space, even if it's flowers that you like that aren't necessarily pollinator friendly, that's good too, because in a way it can be pollinator friendly. You can create an area where solitary bees not be run over by the lawnmower weekly, be trampled on because they're not walking through it on a regular basis. They can just exist and not have to worry about constant traffic and uh, you're reducing the amount of stuff you might be putting on your lawn, whether it be fertilizer and weed killer. You're reducing the amount of carbon dioxide and monoxide you're putting in the air because you're not mowing as much. And you're reducing your time spent. Yeah, that's a good point because a yeah. lot of people don't really know what they can do. And that's something simple, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Then it looks good. Like yeah. You're saving, you're saving yourself a little bit of time and effort. As a beekeeper, knowing what's going on around you, what's in your environment right around you, mm -hmm. um, here in a rural area of Loudoun, mm -hmm which allows these bees to have a lot of forage. Um, we're also fortunate in that a lot of the farming that's done here is not single crop type farming. You see a lot of corn, mm -hmm. see soybeans, things like that, but most of your fields here are fields, mm -hmm. pasture type fields. And those are the areas that you wanna see to have a lot of good bee uh, health and collection of those resources of pollen. Urban bees do very well in uh, urban settings that have a lot of biodiversity for plants. They actually do very well because of that biodiversity of what they're collecting. Having that diversity of different pollens from different plants helps them uh, become a better bee and get the resources that they need. They can get that biodiversity in urban settings. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I never so, thought about that. <laughs> so that leads back to having your little pockets of landing spots for your pollinators to go to with that good biodiverse planting that you do. Um, so that they can go between those islands of, you know, forest and field in your more urban suburban areas, having those pockets to go to and then getting to the next island of forest and field and area like that. that everybody got to learn something from this experience and that you can take away something valuable from this experience. We'll be linking his farm and other helpful links in the description below so you can go check him out and see all the things that he does because he also does a lot more cool things than just what we got to do. Also on his website he has links to buy his honey so go check that out if you saw our previous video about taste testing honey. So if you're local to the Loudoun County area, please go check out Mr. Seuss and in addition Mr. Wellette so that you can buy local and get some nice honey. Thanks for watching. <laughs> See you next time.